What is king in your life will either destroy it or make your life great. And we definitely know that's true for a country. Like, for example, in 1212 to 49 AD, a Roman emperor named Caligula reigned, and he turned out to be a bit of a madman, right? He offended people by declaring himself to be a god while he was still alive. Like, the standard thing in Rome was they, the... the Emperors became gods after they died. Then he would just randomly lock people up and accuse them of treason, just arbitrarily arresting them. And uh, the rumor was he actually appointed his horse as a council member, although that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. But what really like, did in his reign, ended his reign, was when he ordered his soldiers to make war on Neptune, right? Their false god of the sea. He actually had the soldiers wade out into the ocean and slash at the waves with swords right and then he would have he had them carry off you know like shells and starfish and chests as plunder to prove that he had defeated neptune eventually he was assassinated by his own guards because of this and can you imagine living in rome during that time can you imagine the impact of having a ruler like that what the impact would be on the country I mean, we don't have to imagine too far, wonder too far, because the leadership of our own country is in shambles. Look at the pandemonium it has left our country in. And the same is true in our own lives. Who or what is king in our life will either destroy it or make it great. Now, if you were to pause and think about it, just think about it for a minute, who or what is truly king in your life? As many of us are Christians, many of you who are listening online, you're probably listening to a sermon, you're a Christian, and so our knee-jerk reaction would be to say, Jesus, he is king. But is that really true? Is Jesus really the king? Or do you just think he should be the king? Right? There's a difference there, right? Sometimes we, what we know is not what we truly believe. We talk about that every once in a while. We recognize that that I can know that Jesus is my king, but not believe that he is my king. And I would define the difference as belief changes the way that we live and knowledge is a tool that we use. So many things try to become king in our lives and can. Money, greed, ourselves, sex, pleasure, politics, emotions, family, pain, hurt, right? Other people, right? I mean, you name it, and they're all out there declaring themselves to be king. I want to rule in your life. And the result in a word, brokenness. And we see the extremes of that every day. For example, uh, just this week, a 28-year-old confused person walked into a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee, and shot and killed six people. And we're still in a haze of confusion as we seek to understand why anyone would want to do that. But it's not the only time, right? According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 130 cases of mass shootings already this year. 130, not all in schools, but 130 they define a mass shooting as four or more people shot in one incident. I mean, that's more shootings than there have been days in 2023. Now, is this not brokenness? And that's not all. Anxiety rates are high, addictions are still killing people and more. But even in the less extreme, right in our own lives, we find hurt and brokenness. From family members who won't talk to each other anymore, to divorce, to stress that leads to sickness, to fear, to anger that leads to depression. The result is brokenness. And we're experiencing it every day depending on who is king in our lives. And this is when we are reminded that we are what we are celebrating, that we are remembering Palm Sunday. After three long years of ministry, Jesus knows that the time has come for him to finish his mission. The disciples are prepped to carry on with the work that he started. And soon, soon they would have the Holy Spirit who would, you know, in them, and they would turn the world upside down. Before that. Jesus had to tell the world who he was. So let's see what he is doing 
how he does that in Luke chapter 19, starting verse 28. But let's pray before we go any further. Father, we come now to this point where we're going to look at your word, and we're so thankful that you have given it to us. And as we look at this passage today, Lord, we ask that you would um, speak to us through the midst of it. Lord, we want to surrender ourselves to you and say, Father, have your way in each and every one of us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So let's take a look. We're in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28. It says, When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say this, The Lord needs it. And so those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? Well, the Lord needs it, they said. And then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the colt, they helped Jesus get on it. And as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. And now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, If they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Now, to start off with, let's take a look at these crowds because in reality, they are a lot like us. Jesus rode into Jerusalem with a large crowd cheering Jesus on. Well, why? Well, because the Jews were done with who was currently ruling their country. They had had enough of the Romans who began their reign over Israel with bloodshed and were cruelly killing any who resisted their rule. They were done with a country that did not respect them, a country that stole from them, a country that abused them. And so they were excited about the only one who had a right to rule. And sure, they didn't understand Jesus' mission. Yes, they thought he was coming to establish an earthly kingdom, but their praise of him was a healthy mistake. They wanted a change. The world was not the way it was supposed to be. God was supposed to be the one who ruled and led their country. And although they wanted a new King David, basically, who was a man after God's own heart, they were actually asking for Jesus, who was God, to be their king. They were looking for a godly ruler. That's what they wanted. And they knew that they would have that in Jesus. And in wanting this, they were looking for peace. They were looking for an end to the brokenness, the end of death and destruction. And is this not similar to what we want? Aren't the crowds like us, sick of the brokenness, sick of the hurt, the anxiety, the pain? Are we not excited about the one who comes to be king in our life, the one who can make us whole inside and bring us peace and joy? And they were overjoyed about Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer to the brokenness. Jesus was in one large parade, kind of pulling back the veil, the confusion about who he was, to reveal who he is. He was saying, I am king for all who would listen. However, from the very beginning, we can see that his kingdom and kingship was different from anything we would expect in this world. He came not in strength, but in humility. He rode not to his palace but, and throne, but into the temple. And then there was the way he ran his ministry that had, been up, that had been run up to that point. I mean, three years he'd been running the ministry. And he had not overthrown any soldier or politician, but instead had overthrown disease and death and hatred. No, Jesus is a king like no other. And when he stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, hey, they say that you're a king. Are you a king? He said, yes! But not of this world. Not of this world. His kingdom is not political. It's not on this planet. And as the authors of the New Testament began to understand more and more about the 
about Jesus. The, myster- the mysterious writer of Hebrews informs us that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. M- Let me say that correctly. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, if you don't know, was an Old Testament king who was also a priest of God Most High. And this means that Jesus is both high priest and king. And yet he is also God. This makes him divine. So Jesus is and remains the divine priest king who redeemed us from our sins and stands before his Father interceding on our behalf. And this is who we are called to make a commitment to. It is Jesus, the divine priest, king, redeemer, who we say, I do to essentially. He is the one we surrender to and make the Lord of our life. But is that how we treat Him in our lives? Because, I mean, to be honest, we can't afford to not have our lives in right standing with God. That is when the brokenness starts to creep in. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem because it was time for His kingdom to be established. It was time for him to claim his own. And this would ultimately be determined by his death and resurrection, right? In his death and resurrection, he defeats Satan. And Satan, yes, has some power while we wait for Jesus to actually fully uh, bring his kingdom here on this planet, waiting for people to be saved. But Jesus is king. And he's declared that he alone is the divine priest king who redeems us and nothing else will be king in his place, but who is king in our lives. He rode into Jerusalem declaring himself to be high priest king, you know, the divine priest king. What about in your life? See, Jesus wants to be king there also, but ultimately that depends on you. And it depends on how you answer these three questions. First off, do you truly believe that Jesus is a king in your life? Who do you really want to be king? And lastly, what kind of king? Like, where do you want him to be king in your life? I mean, really, do you truly believe that Jesus is king? Many of us are Christians. We've already accepted Jesus as our Savior. But do we truly believe him to be king in our lives? Or do we just know that he is supposed to be king? Remember that at least for some of us, at least remember at least for this time, we're defining belief as you know, something that causes and affects the actions and changes in the way that we live. And so part of the problem that we can have with Jesus' kingship is that we can suddenly change him from king to something else. It's easy for him to suddenly become, instead of king, a teacher to us or an advisor or some sort of ideal that we are to strive for or just a guru or, or some other, other, you know, thing. And these are subtle changes. Often we're not aware of it, right? Uh, the transition is very innocent. We start out by declaring, Jesus, I want you to be king in my life. But then the next day we wake up and simply do the things that we already did. Do the things that we normally do. Not because we consciously want to take the reins back in our lives. Though there are times when we do that. But oftentimes it's because we are creatures of habit. Just going through the motions of life. And we'll know that if we're treating Jesus as king depends on how we treat his word. How do we treat his word? Is it treated with the respect of a king who has the right to determine what I should do in life? Is his word revered and believed? Or is it simply a suggestion? Are we living our lives in a way that when we are challenged by Jesus' words and teachings, that we surrender to it? Or are we simply taking them under advisement? And this means for all areas of our lives, not just in church, not just in Bible reading, but in the media we consume, in our work relationships, and how we treat ourselves. Right? Are they in alignment with God's Word because He is King in our life? But then secondly, I mean, who do you really want to be King? Do you really truly want Jesus to be King? Is that really what you want? Because the choice is up to you. But it's not always an easy one to stick with. Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to declare himself king, and he wants to be king in your life also. And this king, he brings life and joy and peace and strength and community and friendship and purpose and guidance and healing and so much more. I mean, why are people excited about Jesus becoming king? Right? Because he is amazing. He's done amazing things. A broken reed he will not break. 
right? A bruised reed, he will not break. Let me get it right. He brings these things into our lives, and what a wonderful thing it is to have Jesus as king in our life. He overthrows the terror of fear. He stops the errors of sin. He brings peace and joy that can be felt throughout life's hardest days. So the ultimate question is, will you surrender to him? Because just as he rode into Jerusalem to be king, he is riding into our lives asking to be king. He is asking us to surrender our pitiful attempts to control our own lives and to find something greater and more powerful and more meaningful in him, in Jesus. And he's offering to help those who are struggling with depression and fear and anger. It is not... Necessarily that he can just walk in and take those things away. Oftentimes, he works with us as we work through things like counseling and discussing them and working through these emotions. But without him, we're going to struggle to overcome those things. Lastly, though, is where do you really want him to be king? Oftentimes, the lowest level of following King Jesus is letting him have control of our actions. We think that God's real desire is for us to live moral lives so we conform our actions to what we think will make God happy. We become king, he becomes king of our outward appearance. And there's nothing wrong with adjusting our actions to ones that bring glory to God. I and mean, we should do that. But when we truly begin to know Jesus, we begin to understand that he wants to be king over everything in our life. That in fact, he wants to be king over our thoughts and passions. He wants to be king over our inner person. And it is in those moments that we find the true freedom and life that comes from God when we let him truly become king in our heart. And he wants and deserves to be king in and over our heart. In fact, Peter tells us in, this, in his letter in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. The people of Jerusalem were praising God and throwing a party because Jesus was coming in to be their king. They didn't understand him or what he would do. They didn't understand what he wanted to accomplish and what he offered to them. And so today, we should also celebrate because we do. We should smile because Jesus is king. And let's let him be king in our life and let the joy of God flood our soul. He is the divine priest, king, redeemer who brings freedom and joy and an end to brokenness in our lives. So let's surrender to him and let's praise him. And let us pray. Father, we're so thankful that you are king. We just want you to be king in our lives. So we pray that you would work in us. Help us to truly surrender to you and follow you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.